Hi guys, and thank you for tuning in to the second video podcast that we're doing for Flame Tree Wines. And the title of this one is The Provenance of Flame Tree, Cabernet Sauvignon from Vine to Wine. Uh, my name's Leah Clearwater. I am the brand and sales manager at Flame Tree Wines, and I'm sitting with Mark Jolliffe, who sells us Cabernet fruit. So just a bit about Flame Tree first. Um, fairly young winery really in the grand scheme of things. Margaret River Wine Region is about 50 years old. So we uh, started in 2007, the Towner family. Uh, and right from the get-go, they love Cabernet. Uh, their very first vintage, which was 2007, won the prestigious Jimmy Watson Trophy, which is, you know, the pinnacle of achievement in, in Australian wine. So that set the company on a path to, to really showcase the regional heroes of Margaret River, which, in our opinion, are Chardonnay and Cabernet. We do a lot of great varieties. Um, we can grow a lot of different cultivars in this region, but really Chardonnay and Cabernet, we think are the heroes, and I'm pretty sure you can attest to the fact that you, you love Cabernet. Love Cabernet, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's why we buy the fruit from you. So um, I think what's really interesting just to, to get the conversation started is just to educate the consumer that not every wine brand is the same. That doesn't mean we're, we're unequal, but most people probably assume that if you have a, a brand, then you have a vineyard and you have a winery and you make your own wine and then you sell it through the cellar door. But there's actually quite a few different models out there. Um, and it's really good to understand that there's many different ways to skin a cat, I suppose. <laughs> so Flame Tree, um, doesn't own its own vineyards. We source all of our fruit from select blocks and select rows across the whole of the Margaret River region, and then we make their, our wines from that fruit. There are other models uh, whereby people grow their own fruit, but they get the wine contract made at a, at a facility um, separate to their business. So I don't feel that there's any disadvantage to that. You know, some people might think that it's not as romantic to not have your own vineyard to wander around in um, and then take the fruit into the, <laughs> into the winery and stomp on it. But um, I think there's advantages to actually buying contract fruit. Like if you had your own winery, what model would you, would you prefer? Or do you see that there's a, an advantage in being able to select well, fruit? If you had your own winery, you'd basically are looking to make all your fruit into wine and yeah. you might have some patches where you haven't got the the right variety planted yeah. in a certain area, um, which you might not learn until later on. And you can't t change it overnight. So, yeah, I think selecting sites is pretty important for where you plant your, your variety of grapes. Mm. So, yeah, that's an advantage, I guess, for Flame Tree. They can source their fruit from, well, they can source good fruit. Mm, from all over the region. So I thought I would just kick off by asking you um, about your, your family history. It sounds like you go back a long way here in the region, yep. um, starting with cattle farming. Can you just tell us a bit about your family and how you got to this point of actually having vineyards? Sure. So I'm a third generation farmer in Williabra. Um, my grandparents come out from the Isle of Wight in 1924 uh, as, in, as part of the group settler scheme, which... Mm some people might have heard of. Um, my grandfather had come out of the army and obviously it was after the war and he applied to come out and originally was going to go to New Zealand but got uh, offered to come to Australia. So, yes, firstly they settled at Tardanup, which is in from Busselton and they were there for three years and did it pretty hard there and mm. proved that they were genuine farmers. And this property here had had one other settler on it that um, that had come out in the group settler scheme as well. Um, it's interesting. I just met descendants of that first family the, only a few months ago. But oh, um, wow. they how told did you, me how did you end up meeting them? Well, they sort of hunted the property down really through oh. their mother was a child when she came here, and she'd always told stories. But she had only been here for a short time, and her father. I knew that her father had left the property. I always thought that. He'd walked off the property because it was very hard in those days. Mm. So it turns out that he was actually quite ill. So they had to, they were forced to go off the property. So the property had been closed down, meaning they didn't put another family in until they could find a genuine settler, someone who 
was going to stick it out as people come and went, walked off the properties. But so my nana and grandy um, had proven that they were here for the long haul and they got allocated this property. And I, I remember my nana saying when she came out on the horse and cart, and the guy said, that's your property there, Mrs. Jolliffe. And she said, she always told us this. She said, oh, well, that'll do me. She said she was pretty, <laughs> pretty happy with the, uh, the property and the, a beautiful obviously property. the undula undulations yeah. and that appealed to her. Yeah. Um, and certainly different soil types to around Tutton Up is quite sandy. So mm. they're pretty happy with the loams and the gravelly loams that we have here at the time. So, yeah, they originally dairy farmed for cream uh, that mm. went – to the butter factory in Bustleton to So cream, not, not, not milk? There was no whole milk in those days. Oh, it was okay, all yeah. for cream. Right. Uh, the milk was separated. The cream was turned into butter and mm. the skim milk, normally most farms had pigs, so the skim milk was fed to pigs. Um, yeah, so eventually whole milk came in. There was a quota system. Well, for quite a while before the quota system, my father was had then taken over and he was still milking cows um, in an old walk-through dairy. Uh, then as time went on and quotas, a bit, the industry become regulated because they wanted a milk supply all year round, whereas it's pretty hard to produce milk in the summer, especially back in those days. So they found that they couldn't get enough milk over mm. summer. So, yeah, it was regulated. Um, my dad got one of the last – he put in for a quota and got one of the last quotas allocated. He had to build a – New dairy to – you had to have a new dairy to get a quota. So he took a punt and built the dairy and was lucky enough to get a quota, which pretty much changed our whole lifestyle. And, yeah, I mean, it was pretty hard in the early days. Mm. So, um, Dad actually – we got our quota in 1973 um, and I remember my dad working on vineyards – some of the very early vineyards, just picking grapes and that to help supplement income for a start. And, yeah, I I always knew as a kid that I wanted to farm, sort of combined all the things that I, I loved. I love the property and I think I've got a real sense of tradition because of what my father and my grandfather and grandmother did beforehand. Um, they obviously worked very hard to make it a success and, yeah, I always always loved it, so... I decided to come back onto the farm and start milking for yeah. a start. I, I couldn't say that I was ever a passionate dairy farmer, but it was certainly the only way to make a living mm. in this area at the time. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess progressed on. I milked for possibly 18 or 19 years and then I resisted planting grapes for a long time because I also worked on vineyards in the early days. I did a lot of planting around here. Uh, worked at Sandalfords for, did eight vintages at Sandalfords in the crushing shed. Pruned at Sandalfords, which used to take a long time in those days. So you did the hard yards yeah, in the vineyard? Yeah, yeah, certainly. That's probably where I learnt mm. a lot about vines um, and probably why I didn't want to plant vines for a long time. <laughs> Put you off a little bit, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did, for sure. But so what turned you around, Mark? What got you into planting the finally succumbing and, and planting There was vines? plenty of times when I nearly took the, took the punt. <laughs> yeah. I guess my father got ill and mm. he died in 2000. By then I was sort of – I was married and starting – about to start a family and just the hours that were going into milking mm. cows and lifestyle – I wasn't big enough to be able to employ someone um, and a property this size, land values were obviously going through the roof, impossible to expand to milk cows on. I thought well, I had to look at some way of diversifying. By then I was I had been contracting, ag contracting for a long time as well. But I thought, all right, if, if I'm going to stay here um, and my family, if I want to give them an opportunity to stay here in the future, I'm going to have to do something and obviously vines had been proven in the area and I knew that I had a good property for vines. The soils, I've probably got 75% of this farm are gravelly loams. Oh, that's good, yeah. Loams. Yeah. Uh, we'd had lots of people approach us wanting to buy the property even when my father was alive. At one stage we nearly sold some. Dad and I, I can remember us standing there saying, oh, it was a pretty good price we were offered. 
But I said to Dale, well, you know what, I think we can probably make a go of this. And if if we can't, <laughs> then yes, that's always a backup, but yeah. we didn't want to sell. So it made it easier when I did sell a little bit of land later on, having had that discussion with my dad, because he had sort of agreed to sell. Um, so it wasn't like I was selling it out from underneath him. So, so that was a good thing. So what year did you plant your, your vineyard? So I planted it in 2001. Okay. Uh, and I stopped milking at the end of 2001. Uh, oh, really? You yeah. didn't wait until the, the vines were no, into I, bearing? or You you'd had lot, it with the cows. No, <laughs> a, lot, a lot happened. I actually planned to sell the following year okay. my cows. Yeah. Um, but I got made a fairly good offer to buy my dairy cows at the time. Dairy was starting to fairly take off. Um, yeah, luckily I decided that I'd do it then while the offer was good because if I'd sold 12 months later, I probably would have got 50% mm. price for my cows. So, yeah, so the timing was was fortunate, that's for sure. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned the soils. Um, I love talking about soil. Um, I come from a viticultural background and, and I had the opportunity years ago to dig soil pits all throughout the mm -hmm. vineyards. And I think we are sitting on gold in Margaret River with those forest grove gravelly loam yep. so you've mentioned that how do you think that particular soil type which is known for its sort of bony character and um you know it's a bit unyielding in some ways but just perfect for cabernet and northern yeah. chardonnay how do you think that that is so well suited to cabernet in general and particularly to your site here yeah i, I don't know even just about suited to cabernet I, yeah the soil itself just looks so I mean, going from summertime when it looks so dry and as soon as it gets moist and you plough up a paddock, it looks, you know, beautiful chocolatey colour. It mm. changes in colour so much and that that's something that always intrigues me. I think I can look, you know, it doesn't look that great during summertime, but, yeah, as soon as it gets moisture in it, mm. it just looks beautiful. And I love the gravel coming up through it because you get that completely different colour coming through the loam and it just... I don't know, it just look, looks nice. But uh, <laughs> I, how it relates to Cabernet, I, I don't know. It seems to be fairly high in iron. I don't know if that's got yeah. something to do with it. Comes through and uh, yeah, it seems like you need something that's pretty tough to to grow and strive in it. And I mean, Cabernet is pretty tough. Uh, mm, that's true. Hmm. It is. I mean. I think we talk a lot about climate and, you know, obviously in the Margaret River region it's north to south and we, we do see a difference as we go from the warmer areas of the north to the cooler areas of the south. But that beautiful lateritic soil, as you mentioned, the ironstone soils, runs all the way from cape to cape. Mm. And I think that that is a characteristic of the region. Um, and, and like you said, maybe it's not just um, paired well with Cabernet but with all varieties. Mm. It just seems to be the perfect foundation yep. for growing grapes. Yeah, pro probably a combination of the soils and the, and the climate, yeah. obviously. In the right so, a bit of a tricky question. I mean, you sell fruit to probably a number of wineries. Mm -hmm. um, we are very appreciative to buy your fruit to go into our flame tree cab and um, Cliff, our, our winemaker, and Julian Scott, our other winemaker, are very pleased with the fruit that they've purchased from you and and think it's just a perfect fit for the brand. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about starting your own brand? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do. I think about it do a you? lot of the times. Yeah. I, I get a barrel of fruit made, of Cabernet made every year myself, and I absolutely love the wine that comes off here, which is why I plant a Cabernet. I love Cabernet. Yeah. And I knew it was a good area and a good source for Cabernet, but I also thought, well, if no one wants to buy my fruit, I can get it made and I can drink a lot of Cabernet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the worst case scenario. Yeah. I'll have a lot I of had barrels. A backup. <laughs> I had a backup. And between you, your friends and your family, you'd probably make your way through the wine inch yeah, vintage. Well, <laughs> it's getting less and less for friends and family now. It's just my wife and I seem to drink a fair bit of it. So, <laughs> so your consumption's quite good yeah, just on your up. own. It's going up. <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, I, I've thought lots of times about doing it. But I guess I'm 55 now and I think, do I want to start putting a lot of effort in to establishing a wine label, mm. Bu building a winery, obviously? 
until I see if my family are interested in going on with it. I mean, I'd get great pleasure out of it, but by the time I got established, I'm going to be working forever. So, so I probably wanna, will be working you forever. You want to see if your children be. are interested in sort of taking yeah, something just like see what that they, on? If they might want to go and down that path. And yeah. Yeah. So what are the characteristics of, I mean, if you think of Chardonnay as the queen of white grapes and Cabernet as the king of reds, what do you love about Cabernet when you're sitting there at the end of the day and you've been working out in the vineyard, maybe in the winter and it's cold and you come home, light the fire, grab a glass of Cab. What is it about Cabernet that, that you love and, and probably what most consumers of Margaret River Cabernet love? Yeah. I mean, I like the tannins. Yeah. Um, and I love that feel on your mouth. Mm. when you drink it and I love the way that it's the flavor stays in your mouth after you after you drink it after you sip it I, I'm a beef farmer obviously I run cattle here as well so I love having one of my own steaks with <laughs> yeah. a glass of red and it's a real sense of satisfaction as well being able to taste and sit and enjoy you know the fruits of your your work I guess so yeah, yeah it's a I mean it's a beautiful pairing I don't think many people would be able to say that, Mark. I'm, I'm pretty, like, how lovely to come home and have a steak from your beef mm. and a glass of wine from your vineyard. Yeah, no, That's like the perfect life. It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> So obviously selling fruit as a contract grower to lots of wineries, you'd be dealing with a lot of winemakers coming <laughs> out during the season, um, trying to achieve a certain uh, ripeness level, flavour characteristics in the fruit to suit the, the wine style. So... Cliff, our winemaker, how often does he come out and what yeah. kind of comment? Do you walk around the vineyard together? How sure, does it work? definitely. Yeah, no, Cliff comes out fairly regularly during vintage mm. uh, or before vintage, obviously, um, starting fairly early in the season to when the grapes first start to ripen, go yeah. through the raisin. Um, probably, I guess, from Cliff's point of view, he's probably looking for how much crop it's carrying for a start. Um, maybe the, the foliage, you know, how much, how much leaf and that's on there. Um, I do, I like to talk to Cliff to see what he's expecting. Um, I think I've got a fairly clear idea of what's what he practices he likes in the vineyard now. Always willing to do, obviously I've got to weigh up costs of mm. things to maybe the price of the fruit that I'm getting. And But normally I think we've worked pretty well together and I, I've agreed with things that he said. And yeah, I want to produce good good fruit as well and I love getting good feedback when when the winemakers tell me that you know your fruit's looking really good makes you feel a bit more fulfilled that you've done the right thing and, and it's looking good and if if it ever was not looking good I'd want to know why and what needs to be done so so touch wood so far it you know, <laughs> seems to be happy that um yeah so we're basically I got a good understanding try and think I know the things that Cliff's looking for. One other thing I was thinking about is a lot of people that listen to podcasts about wine and, and uh, sort of really interested in wine are often have a bit of a romantic perspective about it, if you like. You know, they see the vineyards over the rolling hills and the winery and the barrels and the beautiful smell of the oak, mm -hmm. you know. And I love all that, yep. and, and I'm sure you do as well. But it's also good for people to realise that there's a lot of hard yakka that goes into just producing a bottle of wine. Yep. So from your perspective, you're, you're growing this fruit uh, and you're selling it to wineries, but I'm sure you have a drive to produce excellent fruit. What are the things that sort of concern you throughout the growing season um, where you think, am I going to get there? Am I, am I going to reach that mm -hmm. goal of what the winemaker from Flame Tree is coming out and saying, Mark, you know, this is the kind of fruit I need. Yep. What, what sort of plays on your mind as a farmer, as, as a vineyard manager? Well, I guess one thing that I always told myself is that I wasn't going to stress over my grapes. I'd stressed too much over animals. Oh. So when I planted, I thought, I'm going to try not to stress because obviously the weather plays a big part and you can't do much about the weather. And people say you, you shouldn't stress over what you can't control, but they're the actual things that you do stress over. The, thing, <laughs> yeah, the right. things you can control, you can at least yeah. do something towards it. But yeah. So I guess timing is a big thing, especially because I run beef cattle and I do ag contracting, trying to get the jobs done at the right time. For instance, at the moment I'm changing broken posts in the vineyard and I've got a system worked out that if I don't 
do it before the ground starts to dry out. I have held problems getting the old posts out. I've got a sort of a little way that I do it that works perfectly without me having to dig the post out. So, yeah, they're the sort of things that uh, do play on my mind. If I'm doing something else, I think, right, I've got to get, and I will stop other things to get those sort of jobs done. Obviously, pruning is always, I try to, depends on the season, get a bit of a feel for it, and some years I'm happier to prune a bit later. But a year like this, I just had a feeling that the season could drop out, so I, I pressed my pruners to start a bit earlier. Um, and they, I've finished today, actually. The guy wrapped down the last cane today. So, yeah, that was good. Um, I, I don't spray my own grapes, so I have a contractor do that. So that takes a bit of pressure off in that, that regard. They're really good. They always do it when I want it done, so that's fantastic. I guess the biggest stress was at planting when I planted that I was still milking cows at the time. So there was yeah. a lot of work. And I did make a conscious decision when I planted the grapes to go dry grown, um, which was the traditional way, I guess, in the area. And I, I did plant a lot of grapes when I was younger with another guy who lived next door who planted Cullens, Fomoy, um, oh, lots of vineyards around the place. So I worked with him. And obviously when I planted in 2001, a lot of people were going to three metre rows, whereas traditionally they might have been 3.6 or 3.4. Very wide, yeah. Yeah, I went with the wide rows because of my machinery. Um, so I could fit down the rows, obviously. I've got bigger, bit bigger machinery and I don't like sitting in little narrow tractors. So all those practical sort of things were involved in my decision making for how I did it. Um, is the dry grown, are you happy that you made that decision? Yeah, I, I am. And I knew it was going to be tough for a start. Um, when I was fencing off the, the patch where my Cabernet is in the summertime, getting a fence around, knowing that I was planning the next year, digging the fence post holes because I didn't have a rammer at that stage. But, yeah, the clay, it was quite a dry summer, but the clay down the bottom was still really moist. And I thought, oh, this is a good site here, so... I thought, I know it's going to be hard and I might have to do some hand watering. Um, but, yeah, I knew in the long run it would Got pay through. off. How much of – it's interesting that you say that. Like I've grown up on a cattle farm on the mm -hmm. East Coast and I always watch my dad making decisions. He, he sort of tried a few different fruit orchard situations and things as well. How much of farming – um, because viticulture is basically farming. Mm -hmm. Take the romance of the wine out. You're on the land. You're growing a crop. Yep. You've got to deal with pests and diseases, hail, storms, wet conditions, just as much as any other farming enterprise. How much of it of farming do you think is gut intuition, or something that you've just <sighs> you think, know? I think it's a it's a huge part. But yeah. you probably get your gut intuition for experience and yeah, just different things that you've learnt. Mm. I mean, you're, obviously your gut's not always right, but you've got to have some sort of direction, something leading you to help you make the decision yeah. so that you feel like you're making the right decision. Yeah, it's, I mean, definitely viticulture is agriculture. Um, I My philosophy is the soils, really, looking after the soil. I still run my cows in the vineyard. Um, a lot of people will go, man, you've got to be crazy. But <laughs> because my animals are quite fairly quiet so at the end of every calving season I'll normally have maybe some cows that have lost their calf or haven't got in calf mm. I'll maybe I know that my vineyard will handle 10 to 15 cows so I'll try and instead of selling those cows I'll hang on to them and I'll run them in the vineyard during the grazing season that's uh, unusual okay. yeah I mean people put sheep but not a lot of people put cows no. and look <laughs> this year when I was running wires in the vineyard and I was looking at yeah. cow pats with dung beetles having and gravel stones just sitting on top of the stone <laughs> where the dung beetles have come up for it, mm. I think. Yeah, you know you're keeping healthy balance in the soils there. Yeah. And just my cover crop of clover and ryegrass, basically like a good traditional pasture, um, I look at that and it, it looks magnificent. You know, there's hardly a weed in there and a bit of cate weed, obviously, hard to keep that out, yeah. but, but not a lot. Well, speaking for the owners of Flame Tree and the winemakers and the staff and me 
having to sell the wine and promote the wine. We couldn't do it without people like yourself. And I think listening to your farming philosophy and the fact that you're a third generation farmer and you've got a gut instinct about the land, I really believe that that translates through to the wine that we make from your fruit. So we want to thank you. Oh, thank you. For letting us take your fruit and make it into a beautiful product that lots of people enjoy. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark.